six years ago, I had a stroke that left me struggling with my speech. I am still plagued with a apraxia, knowing what words I want to say, but not remembering how to say them. But that back then, when I had my stroke, my problem was mostly aphasia. As you know, aphasia encompasses many possible symptoms, and I passed through a lot of them on my post-stroke recovery. But I am not going to concentrate on symptoms like not being able to come up with a word for something you want to say, or being able to say a word you don't want over and over again, or having trouble with numbers, or saying yes when you mean no, or not being able to focus on the little words that permeate our language. Instead, I want to talk about four things my, that my aphasia taught me about language and life. Number one, conversation has a lot of filler. I am constantly amazed how much filler is in a normal conversation. Instead of saying, let's go there to eat, a person might say, if you want, I was thinking that we might want to try that restaurant over there if you are hungry. Five words expands to nearly 20. Ac extra words sometimes can connote difference or emotions like a hesitation, but mostly they are empty verbiage. This is because to a fluent speaker, words are cheap. But to a speaker who has aphasia or apraxia, every word is a struggle and a minor victory. So I learned to pick my words carefully, thinking about the easiest and the fewest words to say. Number two. Speaking is a lot like singing. For more than a hundred years, therapists have noticed that people will, were able to sing words that they could not speak. So it was with me. I could sing happy birthday to you long before I could say the words. This is my birthday. This is because the speech sensors of the brain are mostly in the left hemisphere here, the side I had my stroke on, while singing uses areas from all over the brain. But that's fact goes beyond being able to sing a common tune. Consider this. There is a professor at UCSD named Diana Jones. She studies how mu music and speech relate to each other. In 1995, she found that speech can be heard as a song without transforming the sounds in any way, 
simply by repeating a phrase. Here is her example. She thought this was this transformation of speech turning into a song was an allusive example. The sounds as they appear to you are not only different from those that are really present, but they sometimes behave so strangely as to seem quite impossible. But they sometimes behave so strangely. They sometimes behave so strangely. 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 So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. So strangely. She thought this was this transformation of speech turning into a song was an illusion because she considered talking and singing as two separate activities. But are they really? The tonal quality of speech is well known to every Asian speaker, but to English speakers, it is, it tends to be a foreign concept. But people who work with language challenges know that saying and singing are really two sides of the same coin. When a, when a preacher makes the same side inaccessible, the singing side is often ready and able. So I learned that if I was having trouble um, saying a particular phrase, the best thing I could do was to flip my mind into my singing mode, paying attention to the melodic rising and falling of the stress, pitch, and paucity. My speech pattern may not sound like a melody to you, but in my mind's eye, I may be singing. Number three, getting a word in. I used to be a fast talker. I had no problem jumping into a conversation and acting my true sense. Now, not so much. When you pay attention to a typ typical conversation, you appreciate how fast it is and that there are only small pauses where a person can jump in and start speaking. But if you don't say anything, this window closes and you lose your chance. Or sometimes there won't be any pauses and people just interrupt to speak. In either case, to a person with aphasia or apraxia, this is a nightmare. I learned you have to draw attention to yourself. 
I learned to I have to I had to be bossy. To get the far, you have to signal with your face and body language that you want a turn to talk. Lean forward. Raise your hand as if calling for a waiter. But if that doesn't work, be loud. Simply interjecting a loud hum will often turn the whole conversation to you. But if that doesn't work, start a side conversation by asking a question of someone near you. Oftentimes, people will leave the main conversation to join yours. Number four, nonverbal speaking. Aphasia is often considered the hardest part of a stroke. But over the years, I have learned to make peace with it. As I met other stroke survivors, I learned to appreciate the nonverbal the nonverbal ways we humans can communicate. Think of these nonverbal techniques as giving someone a cane to help them walk. Take, for example, gestures. G gestures are the most basic nonverbal solution. We learn them as babies. Think hugs and smiles. And we we find them as it does playing charades and trying to order drinks in a noisy bar. But pointing and pantomime are not the whole story. There is also drawing. From the earliest time, we humans have told stories through pictures, and pictures evolved into symbols and symbols into writing. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. So too, writing down one or two key words combined with a hand movement or two can tell a complete story. Another powerful, powerful tool is music. Music has a emotional component that the other ones don't necessarily have. I found great solace listening to music when I had trouble speaking. It gave me hope and inspiration. Longfellow once said, music is the universal language of mankind. But I prefer the way that see that TV Wonder said it. Music is a world within itself with a language we all understand.